go ahead and be seated. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, we are um, so excited to have you all here. I know we've probably got some uh, some uh, freshmen here for the very first time here with their parents on uh, moving weekend. So we're excited to see you guys. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, if you are a first time guest, if this is your first time being here, or maybe you're a returning guest, we would really like to get to know you a little bit better. And one of the best ways we can do that is by you texting the word guest to the number 94090. Um, what that what will happen once you send that text is there will just be a little information form you can fill out from your seat. Um, and uh, all we're going to do once you complete that is just reach back out to you and say thank you. 
um, and say hello. Um, we just, uh, just want to get to know your story a little bit better. Um, and then if you're interested in learning more about our church, we'd like to get plugged in here. We can certainly start that conversation. But uh, first, we just want to say hello. So uh, take some time, text that number um, if, you're, if you're visiting with us today. Um, and then the rest of you probably pulled out uh, a bulletin whenever you walked in this morning. Um, there's uh, lots of announcements in there. Some of those announcements are falling out of our bulletin. Um, we have a couple of really um, cool things that are happening. This Wednesday, we have our midweek kickoff, and that's for, uh, that's for students, that's for kids, that's for adults. We have some fall Bible studies that will be kicking off this Wednesday. We encourage everybody to be there. There's going to be food trucks. There's going to be um, some games. Uh, we, we just uh, encourage you to be here this Wednesday. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun, um, and it's for all ages. So come on out. We'd love to see you. Um, and then next Sunday is our kickoff Sunday. Um, it's one of the most exciting times of the year. All of our university students are officially back. Um, uh, Texas Tech class will kick off next week. Um, and we just uh, we want to show our support for those incoming students. Um, so make sure to wear your Texas Tech gear. Um, even if you didn't go to Texas Tech, maybe you're coming Maybe you're here from us from, you know, College Station or something. Make sure to wear your Texas Tech gear. Um, I think if you're from College Station, it might burn a little bit whenever you put it on, but just suffer through it. It's okay. Um, but uh, just uh, show some support for our, for our new incoming Red Raiders. We're really excited for them. We're excited for all of our, um, our LCU folks and all of our South Plains folks as well. So make sure to support them next week. Wear your Tech gear um, as we uh, welcome them back. Um, and then uh, one thing I want to remind you is that we share the live stream of our service every single Wednesday, uh, every single Sunday, sorry, today's Sunday. Um, so make sure to share the live stream of that. Right now, you can go over to Facebook. Um, you can uh, click our live stream and click the share button, bottom left-hand corner, and uh, use the hashtag WiseUp whenever you share it. Um, this is an opportunity to uh, show your Facebook audience, audience something encouraging and something challenging. So we hope that you'll take some time and do that today. Um, and then the last thing I want to remind you of is that after this service, after the 11 o'clock service, Service. We're going to have some free lunch in the park for all of our families and university students. So um, come and join us for that. There's going to be hamburgers and hot dogs. It's absolutely free. Um, join us for that time of fellowship. We hope you'll do that. Um, and while you guys are sharing that live stream or salivating over hamburgers and hot dogs, you guys can uh, stand up and greet the people around you. All right, if you will, head back to your seats. Go ahead and have a seat for just a moment. There's this guy in the, the Bible, his name's Moses, and he knew a great deal about holy ground. If you remember, God met him in a burning bush. He called it holy ground. God met him again at the banks of the Red Sea, and God did some great things. God met with Moses again on a mountain, and God inscribed the Ten Commandments for him. Did it twice. So Moses understood what it meant to be with God on holy ground. The interesting thing about that holy ground was that was about a place that God chose to meet. But since Jesus died on a cross and defeated death and the grave and rose triumphantly, we get to have holy ground anywhere Jesus is. And the good news is Jesus is everywhere, all at the same time. So everywhere your feet are is not just your mission field, it's also holy ground. This morning, we're going to sing a song in just a minute about that reality. But I'd like for us to bow and pray for just a moment. Dear Jesus, you are the great God that we worship this morning. We pray that you will take the praises that we sing and offer to you and transform them into something that's pleasing to you, that makes you smile, makes you happy and joyful. God, would you make us more and more into the kind of people 
that you created us to be. We, we acknowledge that too often we seek our own way instead of yours. Please forgive us. And right now, Jesus, as best we know how, we surrender. We give all that we are to you, our dreams, our hopes, our plans, our failures, our successes. Change us, Jesus. Let our hearts and our lives be the holy ground on which you have your way. Yes, Jesus, we acknowledge it's not by anything we've done or will do that we get to experience life with you. Our lives are gifts to us from you. And only by your death and that triumphant resurrection do we know real life. So without you, we have no breath. We have no hope. But with you, because of you, we are transformed. And today... Some of us come with ecstatic joy because this week has been absolutely amazing. And we thank you because we recognize that every good thing comes from you. But dear Jesus, some of us have walked smack dab into struggle and trouble this week. We find ourselves chained to our circumstances, bound by our fear, overwhelmed with the struggle of relationships or a doctor's report. We ask now that even in the middle of the joy and the pain that you would help us see to, to know your presence with us. And we ask that you change everything. We plead with you that our chains would fall, that our fear, fear will bow to you, that our lives would be healed, and that we would know the hope found in you and you alone. Here with you, on this holy ground, we pray, Jesus Christ, in your name. Amen.
change everything. Blind, healed, whole, found, here, now. Jesus, you change everything. Change, fall. Bibles this morning to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29. And uh, if you are a freshman or a new student uh, gathering with us for the first time from Texas Tech or uh, Wayland or South Plains LCU, welcome. I know that uh, parents have started the process of dropping their, their students off. And if this is your first child to be dropped off, parents, I promise you will survive and you will find a form of life that you never knew existed out there. And so uh, good things will be uh, happening. And, and your child being with us, your student being with us is not something that we take uh, for granted. We don't take that lightly. We are committed as a church to pouring into the lives of students. We have a very strategic location from campus, just three blocks from the main entrance of Texas Tech. And so we take it uh, very seriously, the opportunity to pour into your student's life. And uh, by that, I mean we don't just uh, concern ourselves with trying to uh, provide an experience on Sunday morning, but uh, we want to give them opportunities for engagement, uh, opportunities to join us in mission, to be on mission. And hopefully at the end of that four or five years that they're here, hopefully not longer than that, um, but we do hope some will stay here. We, we hope that your student will understand what it is to be on mission where their feet are. That is our mantra. That is our language. That is our strategy that we each one embrace that idea of being on mission where your feet are. And so we fully intend to pour into the life of your students, to invest in them, uh, give them opportunities to be on mission in different venues, and uh, in the hopes that they will leave here and be role models in the community of faith wherever God would, would place them. We've been uh, this summer going through a series We've been calling it a summer of wisdom, looking at that particular genre of biblical literature known as wisdom literature. And uh, this week and next week, we'll conclude that. And so we have taken this uh, proverbial kind of teaching, uh, this wisdom literature about how to live life in a way that is productive, in a way that is effective. And what I want to do today and next week is, is kind of take it to a, uh, another level, another visible uh, level, I think, that will give it flesh and blood. And I want to speak from two prophets. We could actually, I could have gone to Joseph. Joseph, the language of wisdom is used in association with Joseph, the life of Joseph, how he negotiated the difficulties and the circumstances of, of his life. But I, I want us to look at two prophets. And prophets in the Old Testament really are uh, the paragons of wisdom. They really are the role models and the examples of wisdom, if you will. They are the embodiment of everything we've been talking about all summer. And uh, so today I want to talk about Jeremiah. Next week we will look at Daniel. And I want to talk about living faith at the University of Babylon and uh, what it is to live faith in exile. And that's what, what Jeremiah is speaking to. Jeremiah, in chapter 29, 
is offering to his audience then and to us today, he's offering them a wisdom for between now and then. He's offering a wisdom that we are to practice, that we are to exercise between our circumstances and our hardships, our exile experiences now. And I hope we understand that, that we are all exiles. This is not our home as, as believers. As the community of faith, we understand that God is preparing a place for us. But in the current context, right now, we are pilgrims. We are sojourners. We are a people that are just passing through. This is not our home. So as we grow in, in faith, as we grow in maturity, there's a growing detachment from this world, a surrendering of the things of this world as God is preparing us for the place that, that he has in store for us. Now, Jeremiah is writing to a group of people that in 598 B.C. were taken from Jerusalem to Babylon in exile. And, and we need to understand that ag exile is always more than just geographic displacement. Exile is more than just having once been here and now I'm over here. When we speak of exile, exile is that which, which is an absolute upheaval of everything that has ever given your life stability. Everything that has given structure to your life. Everything that has made your life manageable. But the exile is when all that is turned upside down and you're having to rebuild your world. New students are going to experience an exile experience. Parents that are dropping off students are going to experience exile. Life is going to be vastly different from anything that you have ever known before. And so from the ground up, you're going to have to build this new way of living, this new way of managing life. And so exile is something that, that, that is a social upheaval. It is a moral upheaval. It is a cultural upheaval. Everything that gave predictability to your life is over. That's exile. Doesn't have to just be a di geographic displacement. Some of you this morning, knowing what some of you are dealing with in your life, there's some of you that are here this morning geographically, but I know you're in exile. I know that things have happened in your life that have turned your life upside down that will never be fixed, that will never be life as you once knew it. And you find yourself in exile. If that's you this morning, and if it's not you this morning, it will be you in the future. I want us to look at what Jeremiah said because Jeremiah is offering some wisdom for how we approach life, how we live life when we're in exile. How we live life, how we are to live faith how we are to demonstrate faith, the wisdom of how we do that between now and then. Life now is an exile as we prepare for what God has in store for us. And the first thing we notice that we have to acknowledge what Jeremiah does is he offers a wisdom that is established upon facts. He establishes a wisdom or he offers a wisdom that is based upon facts. It is wisdom in facts. Now, as I begin to read verses 8 through 10, I want you to recognize that what Jeremiah is doing, it may sound harsh. It may sound, it may sound less than compassionate. But what, what, what Jeremiah is offering to his audience in Babylon is pastoral care. And the pastoral care that Jeremiah is offering is based upon facts. I want you to listen to these words. Jeremiah, in writing this letter, he says, beginning in verse 8, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams which they dream. For they falsely prophesy to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. And so there were false prophets in Babylon. There were false prophets and false priests among God's people in Babylon in exile. And here, here, here was the falsehood of their preaching and their messaging. They were saying to the people what they wanted to hear. They were saying to the people that which evoked a good feeling 
It tickled their ears. Their message was, listen, this is short-lived. What you're experiencing now, and listen, this is just, this is just next, by next week, everything's going to be just fine. You'll be back to the way things were. You'll be back in Jerusalem, and everything is going to be just fine. It was tickling their ears. False prophets always say what you want to hear. Now remember, Israel has a long history of stoning her prophets, right? And the reason that, that, that Israel hated her prophets, despised her prophet, listen, Israel loved the prophets after the fact. You're never more blessed as a prophet than after you're, than after you're dead or gone. Then all of a sudden you're a blessed prophet. But when the likes of Jeremiah and Daniel were preaching to the people, any of these prophets, major and minor, the people didn't like it because they told a message based upon facts, truth. Truth isn't always pleasant. You know what people would say about Jeremiah and the message that he's preaching here? You know, I really don't like Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah, he doesn't make me feel very good. You know, I just, I just can't stand listening to him preach. I always, when I leave, I just, don't, I just don't feel good. False prophets tell you what you want to hear. False prophets evoke a good emotion within you for the moment. Jeremiah, the Lord says through Jeremiah, these are not my prophets. In fact, he says in verse 10, and listen, it sounds so harsh. He says, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. 70 years. No wonder they didn't like his message. You know what he's saying to them? You're going to die here. Doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? But what the true prophet of God is having to do, he's trying to posture the people of God, the community of faith. He's trying to give them a message that is based upon facts. Once you understand things, how things really are, he doesn't try to give them this false Pollyanna message that, listen, if you'll just have enough faith, if you'll just pray harder, everything's going to be fine. No, he's giving them a message based upon facts. Things are not going to be fixed. You're going to die here. These are the facts of your current condition. I'm really perplexed and puzzled sometimes by those that are shocked, especially in the community of faith, that so many are, are shocked by suffering. I mean, the symbol of our faith is, is a cross. And so I'm always a bit taken back when when I encounter individuals who are troubled by hardship. Because it seems every generation has an awareness of, of the sufferings of life, the hardships of life, that things happen in life where, where, where the wheels just fall off. Someone dies, someone leaves, there's a diagnosis of a, of a disease. Everything is thrown into an exile experience. And then, and then we, we seem to have some that that think themselves deserving of an explanation as to why. This seems to be the first generation that is offended by suffering. Offended by, by trials and, and tribulation. As if they are somehow deserving of, of an explanation. You know, within the realm of theological study, there's a little nuanced area referred to as theodicy. And theodicy has been around for a long time. I see a lot more traction around that arena now. But it, theodicy is, is this area uh, that, that seeks to explain how, how you have suffering in this world, uh, the innocent suffering, and then you have this God that, that is all-powerful, that is all-knowing, that is all-loving. And how, how do you reconcile these two together? That, that's, that effort is what's referred to as theodicy. As if we're deserving of some explanation as to why we experience adversity in life. Because really there, there is no adequate explanation. There is no explanation that, that brings comfort. 
There is no explanation of why that, that brings satisfaction to our curiosity. The reality is, is that in the brokenness of this world, there are things that are going to happen that cannot be fixed, that will not be fixed. And we can try to deny the pain. We can try to, to pretend that we're really not hurting because sometimes we've been led to thinking, we've been wrongly led into thinking that as people of faith, we can't really pretend the pain is real. No, pain is real. You can, we can sit around and play make-believe like we're not hurting and we can quote the 23rd Psalm and talk about green pastures. But listen, reality is the hard facts are that green pastures pastures turn into dry parched land sometimes we can sit around and give our little Sunday school answers and and pretend we're not hurting and and talk about still waters but the hard facts are still waters turn into turbulent seas sometimes and so if we're really going to have wisdom between now and then we need to get over this idea of playing make-believe as the people of God, pretending that we're not really hurting, that the pain isn't real, because if we embrace it, it can evolve into much more. We participate in the redeeming purposes of God. And that's the second thing that Jeremiah offers here, not just a wisdom in fact, but also a wisdom on mission. You see, Jeremiah has the wisdom and the forethought to see that we're going to embrace our pain. We're going to embrace now our circumstances. And I want you to see how God is going to use this. And here's how you accomplish that. Listen to the wisdom of these words. He says in verses 5 through 7, and notice the verbs. Just underscore, underscore, underline in your Bible the verbs that are used here. Those are action words. If you don't like writing in your Bible for whatever reason, you know, etch them into your mind. But look at the verbs here, build houses. Here's the wisdom of Jeremiah in your circumstances, in your exile, when your life is turned upside down. Be active, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat their produce, take wives, become the fathers of sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city. Daniel's going to show us how to do that next week. But are you shocked by that? He says, you're a people in exile, but what I want you to do is I want you to pray and I want you to seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. In other words, what, what he's saying is embrace your place. Live. Don't, don't just survive. Live. Flourish in the midst of your circumstances. Lean forward. Bloom where you're planted. Play the hand that you're dealt. Don't just be a survivor. I want you to flourish in these circumstances. Listen, Jeremiah is saying to the people of God, to the community of faith in the midst of their exile, in the midst of their life being turned upside down in a way that they would have never anticipated. He says, listen, I want you to stop singing the exile blues. If you can't sing now, you'll sing nowhere. If you can't sing now in the midst of your circumstances, because circumstances are going to change. If you can't sing now in your circumstances, you will not sing anywhere. And here's how I want you to flourish. The people of God, they grab their place. They stand in their place. They understand providentially, this is my circumstance. This, there's no other option. I'm in Babylon. I've got to be where my feet are. I've got to build houses. I've got to build a house here. 70 years, you're going to be here. Go ahead and build you a house. Plant you a garden. Let your kids marry. Listen, if you want grandkids, this is where it's going to happen. Don't wait to get back to Jerusalem. Don't wait until you have a better set of circumstances. If you want grandkids, you better let your kids go ahead and marry. You're here for the long haul. You see what it says to us, our place, our place is where we are. As the people of God, we don't think about where, where I might be, where I should be. We just think about where we are. That's what it is to be on mission. 
We've done a pretty good job, I think, as a church of moving beyond this idea of missions being something that is done by someone else somewhere else. We understand as the community of faith, we're an offensive unit that is being trained and coached, inspired to go out into the world. That the mission field is where my feet are right now. We do a great job of that. That's our message. So he says, be a people of of action. This is where your faith is played out. Your faith isn't real back in Jerusalem. Your faith isn't confirmed. Your salvation isn't confirmed, listen church, in a baptistry. Your faith is proved out on a day-by-day basis. When you're living obediently, when you're living faithfully, that's just an act of initiation. That doesn't prove salvation up there. Don't hold on to some kind of false security. That doesn't prove salvation, that baptistry. Faith and salvation is proved out on a daily basis. Walking in obedience, building houses, being active, being where your feet are. That's where, that's where faith is proved out in the crucible of our pain and our suffering. That's where, that's where faith becomes influential. That's where faith becomes noticed by others. When the fruit of the Spirit in the midst of difficult circumstances is being born out of our lives. Listen, the world is not impressed that we're gathered here. I mean, any reprobate can walk through this door and sit in church on a Sunday morning. There is nothing uniquely special and distinctive about us having been here on Sunday morning. Anybody can walk in here. But what people don't expect is for faith to be alive and vibrant, fruit-bearing out in the community. And so it says to us as a people of God, a people who understand the significance of place, that faith is not proved out in our sanctified sanctuaries or our sanitized classrooms. We are not a people called to sequester ourselves, to isolate ourselves. We are a people that are called to go forth. You cannot be salt sitting in the pantry. You cannot be a light under a bushel. So we do not go out into this world in fear. We go out understanding that where we are is the place that God has providentially placed us. Jeremiah offers a final thing. Another offering of wisdom is a wisdom of hope. Verses 11 through 14 are probably the most well-known verses in this passage. But I want to tell you something unique about these words that, that can be easily missed with just a casual reading. He says in verse 11, For I know the plans that I have for you. Remember, he's writing to a people that are in exile. That's his audience. Exiled Jews in Babylon. Since 598, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, which is what you should be doing already, all of us in exile. We should be a people who call, a people who seek, a people who pray. You will seek me and find me, verse 13, when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations, from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. Now don't miss this church. This is a part of understanding the strategic purpose of the church, which is to go into all the world and make disciples. Jesus is writing to the Jews in exile in Babylon, not in Jerusalem. See, when the Jews of Jerusalem, when some of those were taken from Jerusalem and taken to Babylon in 598, there was a tension. There was a tension created between those Jews in Jerusalem and those Jews in Babylon and those Jew, because the Jews in, in Jerusalem thought themselves a favored people of God. But what God is saying through his prophet, Jeremiah, my hope is on your back. 
My future plans are upon you, those who are in exile, those that are living in challenging circumstances. What I desire to accomplish is being built on your backs, not those back in Jerusalem. You know why? Because those folks back, those good religious folks back in Jerusalem, they are self-satisfied with their, with their sanctuary religion. They're self-satisfied with the temple. And it serves as a warning to us that, that we have to be very careful about, about claiming a faith when all of a sudden uh, we allow faith to be skewed towards a sanctuary type religion. And by that, I mean a religion that is satisfied with having been here. And you know you've crossed over into a sanctuary type religion instead of a vibrant faith and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that understands I'm supposed to be on mission out in this, in this world of exile. You know that, you have become, that you've just become a person that has a sanctuary religion when all of a sudden your greatest concern about the church is not the fulfillment of its mission but the maintenance of everything that goes on inside. Well, you know, that's not how we do things. Sanctuary religion. Well, I noticed the top of the cabinet didn't get wiped off very well here. Thank you, Mr. Sanctuary Religion. I noticed the toilet paper was coming underneath instead of rolling over the top. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Religion. You see, sanctuary religion is just concerned and satisfied with having gathered. God's hope is in people that are living in exile. This is where, this is where true faith is going to be exuded. This is, where, this is where true faith and true relationship with the living God is going to become evident. It's going to be seen in the lives of those who are struggling, not those that are satisfied playing church. God's future, even though your circumstances seem unbearable, even though your situation is seemingly overwhelming can't even imagine a future the prophet comes to say to those exiles and those that are living with hardship you're my you're my future the future I have in store and my plan for redemption is built upon your backs your circumstances do not trump and the circumstances of this world do not trump my providential purposes. The future, God says, that I have in store for you, it will not be threatened by what's happening to you right now. That's wisdom between now and then. Let's pray together. Our Father, how grateful we are that you abide with us in our present circumstances. That we need not grow weary or defeated because of the things that happen to us that turn our worlds upside down. Father, might each one of us realize that it is through this season of bearing burdens, that it is in the season of enduring hardships, that faith has its opportunity to flourish. That in these things and through these things, we have the capacity to show that our faith is real, that our hope and our faith and our trust is not built upon the offerings of this world or the circumstances of this world. But we endure and we persevere and we live victoriously because our hope is in what comes next. Believing that you are a God that makes all things new. Father, we know this can't be understood apart from a personal relationship with you. That these things start to be understood only as we begin that journey of faith and following Jesus. And Father, I pray this morning as we open this altar, as we open the altar of our hearts, that maybe some would answer that call to follow Jesus today that others would come and join this church family to be a part of, of the missional pursuit that is the fabric and the identity of who we are seeking to be. 
We can't do it alone. We do it only together. We need all people, all gifts to join and to be a part of what you desire to accomplish through us. And so it's in that spirit that we give this time to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.